Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the last day of the Open Textbook Network Summit. Thank you for joining us for today's session entitled Community Conversation, Open Education in the Time of COVID. My name is Tanya Groves, and I'm the Director of Educational Programming for the OTN. If you're not familiar with us, we are a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open ed. You can learn more about us at open at open.umn.edu forward slash OTN. I'll be serving today as the um, moderator of the Q&A for today's session, and I'm joined by Sarah Cohen, Senior Managing Director of OTN, who will be facilitating the session. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few important details with you. The hashtag for the summit is hashtag OTN Summit 20. We are live tweeting our sessions, so please join us on Twitter at, at open underscore textbooks. This webinar is being recorded. For that reason, you've been muted. The video and transcriptions will be posted on the Open Textbook Network's YouTube channel after the summit has concluded. The last several minutes of today's session will be for questions. To submit a question for our presenters, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can then learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu forward slash summit community norms. Please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. Welcome. Thank you, Tanya, and good morning, everybody. What a pleasure to have you um, join us this morning on this last day of our 2020 summit. Um, before we begin, I wanted to um, set some context for today's session. Um, this session is for OTN members. And as I said on Monday's session um, on the state of the states, um, that was really focused on a statewide perspective of what is going on in this time of great uncertainty. And I think it's a great time to remember that this is very much what our community is about. It's about um, surfacing our challenges and the uncertainties um, and the issues that we're facing in open education at our individual institutions and even at a larger level and talking through them together um, and exploring what we can do together to address them. So this is very much in line um, with what we hope you find the OTN community to be about. Um, today, we wanted to take a more institutional perspective onto this challenging time. And so um, we've invited five panelists from different institutions, um, different types of institutions around the country. So it's not just the type of institution, it's also where they are located. Um, and I hope, that we will get to have an interesting and productive conversation about what each of these panelists are facing um, as we go forward. Um, all of the panelists do have open education as a core responsibility um, in their position. So let me introduce you to them. Um, today's panelists, um, we're delighted to welcome Lauren Ray, um, the open education and psychology librarian at the University of Washington. Happy to have Olivia Reinauer, Coordinator of Library Services at the Chesapeake, Virginia campus of Tidewater Community College. I'll also say that Olivia is one of the instructors for the OTN Certificate in OER Librarianship. We're also welcoming Ariana Santiago, the Open Educational Resources Coordinator at the University of Houston. Hello to Elaine Thornton, Open Education and Distance Learning Librarian at the University of Arkansas Fayetteville, also an instructor in the Certificate in OER Librarianship. And Michael Whitchurch, the Digital Learning Services Librarian at Brigham Young University. Welcome to you all. Um, the format for today is that each of our panelists is gonna share some reflections um, on kind of open education in the time of COVID. And then we have some prepared questions that we're going to walk through and then um, give plenty of time for you to ask questions. Um, we also had asked in the OTN Google group for some questions. So we have um, a few of those to explore as well. 
So I'm going to turn it over to Lauren for her initial reflection. Thanks, Lauren. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I'm really happy to be part of this conversation today. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, I'm at the University of Washington, which is in Seattle. Um, many of you are probably aware that Seattle was kind of the first epicenter of the COVID pandemic, um, which seems so long ago now. Um, so just a little bit about uh, my library and OER since COVID. Um, we um, shut down the University of Washington libraries um, and campus around the second week of March. Um, we've all been working in the libraries at um, stay at home since that time. Um, as some of you might remember, this happened uh, right during Open Education Week. So um, it felt like there was a sort of a, a lot of activity happening um, and the culmination of a lot of work happening right as we were sort of all going into our um, shutdown at home. Um, so, but since that time, um, we've had a lot of really rapid communication changes across the libraries. Um, there's been um, a very active um, new Slack channel, um, lots of meetings uh, moving to Zoom, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with. Um, and we have uh, multiple coming back to campus task forces in our library system um, that are really working um, daily to kind of talk about um, planning for all of these changes and um, kind of dealing with the uncertainty around um, what will happen with our campus. Um, currently, we're closed um, throughout the summer, still at stay at home, and expect that um, there's potential for that to extend into the fall. Um, we, in addition to making communication changes across the libraries, um, our libraries um, appointed a new interim director for online learning and innovation, which is sort of a um, six month um, temporary department that's been created. And I think, in addition to that, there's been a lot of talk about how we might restructure ourselves to really center our work in the libraries um, um, directly towards um, supporting online education. So I think in general, which I'm guessing is um, also a theme amongst other panelists here, there's just been a lot of um, conversation in our libraries about what this moment means in terms of equity um, and obviously um, a sharp focus now on online education. Uh, being at a research focused um, institution, I think for our libraries, there's also sort of the shift to thinking about um, everything that we do um, uh, with more of a lens towards teaching and learning. Um, so this all means sort of an intense focus on open educational resources. Um, and I think for myself, I've just been um, trying to remain calm <laughs> and um, see the potential for how we might sort of expand and dig into um, our um, services around OER, um, but also recognize that, you know, this is gonna be sort of a, a, a long ongoing process. And even um, at the point that we come back to campus, um, things are not going to be the same. Um, there's gonna be a lot that's changed. So I'll just end it there and, um, yeah, thanks so much for um, putting together this panel. Thanks so much, Lauren. Mm -hmm. We're going to go all the way to the other side of the country and perhaps your screen over to Olivia. Hi, so yes, hello from Eastern Virginia. Um, again, I'm at Tidewater Community College. And um, let's see, so we stayed open just about as long as as we could until our Virginia governor um, issued a stay at home uh, mandate. So I should probably preface my remarks by saying that when I started becoming involved in OER at my institution, um, I was a librarian, a reference librarian. And so I had a, a lot of time to very strictly focus on OER initiatives. Um, then in 2017, I got a management role and I have been juggling both the management and, and the OER responsibilities. So since, you know, about the beginning of March, since, since sort of the coronavirus um, issues began, I have had to really prioritize my management role um, because we've had so many discussions first before we closed about you know, constant new information every day and updates and changes that we needed to make in the physical spaces 
as we started social distancing before we closed down, um, putting up new signage, coming up with um, new policies and restrictions. And then when we went to teleworking, uh, we had just maybe two or three hours notice that that was going to happen. So when we started working from home, a lot of my meetings and conversations were around how are we, what are the staff going to do from home? Um, how are we going to handle that? And then more recently has shifted to what's going to happen when we reopen, which could be as soon as July or as late as fall or, or even later, just depending. Um, in fact, we had started returning to work on a limited basis on June 11th. Um, but today I had expected to do this call from my office and I'm at home instead um, because we found out yesterday that there was a confirmed case of COVID-19 on campus. So we're shut again. So, you know, it's going to be maybe an open shut, open shut for a little while. Um, I will say that in relation to OER, personally, how this has affected my duties is um, I'm fortunate that I'm not the only person doing any work with open education at my institution, obviously, um, and not even within the library. So we don't have at TCC a specific uh, individual who's solely responsible for any OER work. Um, I, I do chair our team of librarians who does that work, but what I've had to do is kind of step back and let go a little bit of some of those responsibilities and, and let my colleagues pick up the slack, which absolutely they have done beautifully. Um, so I think that's been, I don't know, something that I'll start out with as a reminder and a realization is that uh, we're not alone in doing this work. And sometimes, at least for me, I can become so passionate about it that I kind of want to be the one doing everything. Um, and that's, that's not the best way to go for the institution. So kind of even just stepping back and allowing my colleagues to come in and and to pick up more of those responsibilities, um, I think has actually been a good thing. And it, it means that there's more of us who feel more, more heavily engaged in that work at at the college. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stop there for now. Thank you. I'm really excited to be part of the panel today. Thanks, Olivia. Ariana, can you share with us your experience? Sure. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm the OER coordinator at the University of Houston. And since about mid March, I've been working at home um, when our university um, switched to remote instruction and pretty much started shutting things down. Um, so the we're starting phased reopening, um, but there are still a lot of unknowns as to what that looks like, of course, or when things are going to be happening. But as of right now, um, our library is still closed. Um, and I anticipate that I'll be working at home for um, some amount of time. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of settled in and at home. Um, and it's been interesting, just sort of that working at home experience. Because um, there was, at least from my perspective and how it's been going for me, it's like it was kind of a rough transition at first, but then I kind of took to it really well. And I'm very fortunate that I feel like this is working okay for me in terms of being able to do my work still. And I'm not experiencing major struggles around that. But I know that's not the case across the board. So that's something that I always try to keep in mind um, is that we're all experiencing this so differently and dealing with so many different things. Um, and in terms of open education, um, my focus for the for my main focus right away when all of this happened was I need to keep things going and keep things moving so that instructors at our institution can continue engaging in open education and continue having those opportunities um, in terms of the the incentive program that I manage. So I was like, I need to, I've got some tight deadlines, I need to keep things going, figure out how to make it work. So I was very much in that zone of like, I need to keep things going and not let anyone down, I guess is kind of how I was thinking of it. But that's sort of where I was for quite a while. And I'm kind of out of that and feel like I have more space to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Um, so I'm still kind of in moving into that phase of things. 
Um, I think I'm going to kind of keep it short and sweet and stop here before I just ramble on into who knows what. So. Thank you, Ariana. Elaine, can you share a bit about how things are going for you? Sure. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I kind of go, I'm like Lauren, I kind of go back to all the activity that we had going for Open Ed Week, which was kind of like my uh, before and after. <laughs> um, we had lots of programming. We had just hosted that Friday, March 6th, we had just hosted a very well attended statewide meeting. And for us being um, in Arkansas, we don't have a statewide um, affordability, any statewide initiatives or any affordability legislation. So, um, you know, we were really excited to have all of the librarians, instructional designers, faculty from schools across our state um, come to the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville that Friday for, you know, a big meeting just to talk about, you know, the kinds of things we might um, do to kind of bring some kind of more concerted effort to our state. So we go from that um, to the rumors that start swirling about, you know, campus is probably going to close. The other schools start closing. We were still two weeks away from spring break, uh, but it was pretty, we were pretty sure we were going to be closed sometime between that next Monday and spring break. Um, and then going into that next week, um, my own daughter got sent home from her school um, in another state, and we just started to prepare to uh, be off site. My OER team, um, we had just accepted the most applications we'd ever received for our uh, course materials conversion funding program. And so, you know, like Ariana said, I had to keep all of that going. Um, and I'll also, my other role is distance learning librarian, but, you know, at the time I felt like we had pretty good um, resources in place for that. Um, I'm the actual liaison to our global campuses, which is where most of our uh, distance learning programs come from. So uh, we had a good relationship with them. You know, we were able to help them however possible. Most of our librarians had already done their um, instruction sessions. Those who hadn't um, were quickly able to shift and um, either put online sessions in or the teacher, the professor would just made plans with the professor to just patch them into one of their synchronous sessions. So I think we, our first official day off campus working remotely was March 19th. And that was when the whole library, the whole university closed at that day. Um, you know, instruction continued um, remotely online. Um, library services have continued. As far as our OER work, I don't feel like we've lost any of the momentum that we feel like we had going. We were able to um, still do our applicant interviews you know, meet with the, the selection team. Um, I've been able to on, onboard our new participants. Um, Microsoft Teams has become my best friend. So, you know, all, I think all the tools were in place and, you know, we're still working remotely, working on reopening plans. Um, I don't really see anything that will shift in my work as far as when the library reopens, I'll probably still remain remote because we're trying to keep as few people as possible in the building and on campus and pretty much everything I need to do, I can do online. Um, since we wouldn't be having face-to-face -face meetings anyway, we'll just uh, continue on the path that we've started so far. So that's about where we are. Thank you, Elaine. Michael, could you tell us a little bit about your situation? Sure, good morning, everyone from the great state of Utah where the weather is actually quite nice for a change. Um, where we are, so similar to others, we had planned a series of workshops for Open Ed Week, and those were very quickly canceled. Uh, one interesting thing is our library never shut down. We continued to provide services, small, but the services continued uh, at a distance, and they kept working on moving furniture and doing all sorts of things to try and keep people distanced. Uh, our administrators, there's one administrator in the office every day of the week. Uh, other than that, most people are at home just doing the work that, that we can do. Um, 
the work we've been doing in open education has been on many campuses, I know, on mine especially, it's just been slow. It's been slow to get faculty members up and running. Um, our campus continues to struggle with the whole quality issue of open education, um, but we continue to go forward. We, uh, I, on a kind of personal side note, I had a sabbatical that started April 1st and so personally, this whole thing has affected me a lot. My sabbatical has taken a completely radical turn away from what I anticipated. In fact, I'm going to be requesting a modification to the timeline because of what's happened, because I can't accomplish what I needed to do for, for the sabbatical. Uh, so different things like that have just turned my world upside down. But again, with patients, constant communication, I've been able to speak to a few faculty members, a few librarians about this. Anytime something new comes, I'm able to send it. Uh, and I really see it as a miracle that all the technology is in place where we can, believe it or not, continue not as it was, but education and openness continues despite everything pretty much shutting down. And even meeting right now, the miracle it is that we can talk to each other uh, I hesitate to say face to face, but as good as we can get, we're talking to each other. And it's really amazing that we can still do this and the work is moving forward. Thank you, Michael. I will say it's amazing as well, planning a summit um, in that way. has um, It's amazing that we've been able to do it um, over Zoom and, and to do that. So thanks for sharing that. So I'm going to uh, move if I can get the slides to go. Um, so the way that we're gonna run this section of the talk is I'm gonna ask um, particular people, particular questions, and then the rest of you can chime in. Um, so I'm gonna actually start with Elaine, because Elaine, something you said um, really triggered for me, which was um, pointing out that your role and responsibility balances both OER and distance learning. And so you did mention that you have teams in place, which I think is, is um, I don't want to say special, but I think a lot of people are, um, have less um, resources to devote perhaps to OER in that way. But I, I think it's a pretty interesting question, um, thinking about those dual roles that you play and how have your priorities shifted? So... I, I kind of struggle with that because I don't really feel like my priorities have shifted a lot. Um, we have a funded program. I guess one of the things is that we have a funded program and we have um, faculty who've been working on projects and some of them, their deadlines had passed. So I guess one of my priorities has become with that and partially um, because of their renewed interest in finishing their projects is to kind of give them more support so that they can get finished. So I've been surprised by the increased um, activity of those people who had been slowly working to complete projects so that they could launch them in their courses. Now some of them are determined to implement in the fall. And I think the halt of on-campus instruction and the uncertainties you know, surrounding this whole issue about when will we reopen? Will we have to go back to remote? Those kinds of things I think have encouraged them to um, actually do the work that they committed to do and get those uh, uh, courses in place, those uh, materials in place. I've had some faculty who've already, who had adopted already, express how glad they were because they knew all of their students would have the resources. No one would have to depend on print course reserves and um, you know, so they were really glad to be able to get them done. But I've also had to kind of shift the way that I approach some of the faculty without, with outstanding projects, because one of, a couple of the professors have found this to be a very difficult time because they've had to take on additional work, you know, summer teaching that they didn't plan on doing. So therefore then their OER projects get shifted to a back burner. So, you know, it's trying to find that balance between um, the gentle nudging, because as, you know, program manager, I have to, you know, look at our timelines and try to keep everything, but also, you know, expect to be 
um, compassionate as to some of the things other people are facing. So that's kind of where my priorities are right now. I appreciate you mentioning the compassion. I was in a call recently where someone said, what a gracious time we're all in because everyone is is trying to balance it. Everyone is trying to stay positive. Everyone's trying to work. So it's a good time to experiment. Um, so I appreciate you raising that, Aline. Lauren, I actually am curious a bit from you on this one because I know that um, you've been leading a series of sessions over this summit on press books and the work that you're doing in creation, but you also focus a lot on um, pedagogy. And so I'm wondering, um, are your priorities shifting here? Yeah, um, I was thinking about that this morning and just, you know, I think kind of going back to that communication piece, um, I think as many of us have kind of faced the issue of when, um, when we shifted to an entirely online environment, um, a lot of um, institutions were getting sort of inundated with um, offers from commercial textbook vendors and ed tech. And um, I have previously last year in my libraries, I was doing work, which I talked a little bit about yesterday um, to do training for our subject librarian teams, um, just to sort of like build capacity for OER support in my organization and get my colleagues up to speed on um, press books and OER issues. And I think since we've had this COVID moment where, you know, the kind of issues around um, equity and cost and privacy are sort of thrown into sharp focus because of all of these offers that everyone is getting, um, it made me kind of take a step back and think, I need to do more around that because I, I still think there's like, um, a, it's a very complex issue, you know, the sort of affordable versus free and um, what sort of issues these offers may bring up for students in terms of um, cost as well as privacy. Um, so it's made me sort of think about shifting back to continued um, focus on conversation with, um, with my colleagues in the libraries um, to sort of um, renew those conversations around like what are issues in OER if you get these kinds of questions from faculty or if you yourself as a subject librarian are getting um, advertised these sort of offers like can we sort of talk as a libraries about you know what that means and um, what sort of um, what it means to sort of invest or do these trials that may go away and then offer consequences later so um, I think it's it's been sort of a shift towards like renewed focus on um, sort of um, scaling the conversation and um, having more conversations with um, with different players who may be sort of on the front lines of like responding to questions from faculty and students about um, teaching and learning resources. So um, so yeah. I'll leave it there. Olivia, do you want to add anything there? Because you had mentioned that you're trying to welcome more people into this work. Um, you know, in that idea that Lauren's saying around, you know, trying to reach out to the liaison librarians or different people. Is there anything you want to add there? Sure. Um, yeah, I will say, and I was thinking a little bit, you know, as Lauren was speaking about at my library, our immediate priority has been, well, two priorities, safety and access, you know, and sometimes those two come into conflict in terms of physical access. Um, but we've been sort of, I have to say initially sort of let uh, open education kind of fly out the window in, in a sense, we were just focused on any kind of access, right? So we were kind of dig digging into our toolbox. So we're using things like a database called Swank for streaming films for the instructors that need to show film in their class and um, digging into the ebook collection and um, you know just anything that we could do expanding our online chat service presence for for the access to services um, but that's not sustainable long term and of course there was all the chaos in the spring about you know things textbooks being free it being okay to just scan your textbook and put it 
put it up there, but only for that one semester. And so I'd say the good thing in terms of bringing other people into the conversation is that I think a lot of these issues around traditional textbooks or commercial textbooks have been highlighted and just kind of put, you know, right in people's faces, both the students, the faculty, and the library staff. Um, I didn't realize that some of our library staff who are not, you know, not necessarily librarians, but working in the library were like, well, why can't we just, you know, buy the, the ebook of the textbook and put it up there for everybody to use, like the students buy it. And it's like, so, you know, it's opening up these conversations about why, why those things don't work. Um, and so that also opens the door for, you know, more long-term and sustainably discuss having this open textbook, OER, open education discussion, um, so that there can be sustainable access, not just emergency access. What a great segue, Olivia, into our next question. Um, Ariana, I was hoping you could speak to this one. I, I know that you've been running an incentive program for a while um, and done a ton of outreach. Um, and so, I'm, and you talked a bit about, you know, you see yourself at home for a while. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how are you adapting your strategies um, for open education? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I have found myself sort of adapting um, what I would usually be doing at this time of year. Um, and that's because I have been seeing a little bit more interest in OER um, in terms of people coming to me, um, whether that be faculty or campus partners. Um, and I feel like they, in this moment, are recognizing the value of open education and seeing it as a way to support the transition to online or remote instruction or um, an opportunity to encourage others to explore OER. And I haven't been pushing that message in terms of like trying to jump on like an opportunity to promote OER, which I think this can be, but I've seen people coming to me and recognizing that. Um, and the way that um, affects my strategies right now is that at this time of year, I wouldn't normally be putting um, a lot of time or effort into um, new pro promotional strategies or outreach opportunities because as I mentioned before this is the time of year where I'm really like running parts of our incentive program and kind of doing that management and you know spreadsheets everywhere <laughs> and things like that and kind of getting our new incentive cohort up and running um, so in another scenario I might have said if someone said, oh, would you like to do a presentation for faculty right now who are maybe interested in OER, I might have found a way to say, no, I, you know, I don't have the time or capacity right now, but I've been a lot more um, flexible and open to taking on those, those new unexpected things that have come to me because that's meeting an immediate need for people right now. Um, so I've been really kind of going with that and saying yes i'll present here or yes i'll you know run a panel with faculty or yes i'd love to be involved in this other thing like a faculty member organized her own panel for her college and invited me to present as part of it and i thought that was a really great way um, to continue encouraging people to engage with open education and meet their needs um, but it was really in the hands of the faculty member who took the initiative to do that. So that was something great too. So another kind of strategy is that I'm um, really put, try, putting things in the hands of our faculty champions. Not to say that I didn't do that before, but I'm not so concerned with maybe um, planning something and setting it up perfectly in terms of what my outreach strategy would be. It's like, yes, you're excited and you're enthusiastic about this and you want to help your colleagues like run with it. I don't even really have to be involved that much. Um, so I'm seeing some of that happening as well. Um, so it's kind of, um, kind of a positive aspect of adapting my strategies, but it's really kind of breaking away from where my focus would typically be right now and and, and meeting those needs that are coming up and, and meeting that interest that's there. Great, thank you so much, Ariana. Michael, do you wanna add anything? I know that you had mentioned that, you know, it's slow going at your institution. Um, and so I'm wondering about, um, are you adapting or thinking about making any, any kind of shifts um, in, this, in this time? Well, I kind of speaking also to the shifting priorities, it 
it works well with, with our adapting. We just found out this week what's going to happen in fall. Uh, our campus is going to open for on-campus courses, but many of them will be hybrid or some will be fully online. There will be more online courses. There'll be hybrid courses. And so what's going to happen to me adapting and shifting is now that I know what is going to happen this fall, now how can I help? Because many of them, yeah, they were forced into this online teaching this last semester, which was more very, very difficult for some. In fact, I heard a report of one faculty he taught one of the students that I knew who said, um, okay, the grade you've got is the grade you're gonna get for the semester because I'm done. He didn't even continue through the rest of the semester. He just said, I'm done, I'm cutting it off. And I, I don't know who it is or the circumstances behind it, um, but we had faculty like that. So how can we support faculty in those situations who may not be technically adept at this kind of thing? Um, reaching out to, we also found out that there are going to be more online courses. So BYU Online is who does those courses. Developing those, I've got a good relationship. So how can I work with them to do the same thing? And it's, it's doing the same things I've been doing, but in a different priority and in, the different, uh, in a different order of getting the things done because they're the ones now that are in desperate need of these types of resources. And related to that, something that uh, I think, I can't remember who brought it up, bad memory, but related to the vendors who are coming and directly contacting the faculty, how can we get faculty to understand, educate them regarding what does that mean that they have free and open access to this content for now? And it's kind of like a gateway drug um, you get them hooked and then they can't live without it. So then where's the money going to come from? And anyway, so those are some of the issues we're going to have to deal with, but regarding open educational resources, can we get that content to them without the, the, the hook, meaning it's a choice to take it or leave it instead of having to pay for it afterward. Th those are some of the things we're going to be adapting into the future. Michael, it's such a great um, segue again into our next question. And actually I'll say that was one of the questions that came through the survey was kind of the perspective of um, uh, managing expectations with the onslaught of temporarily free um, or temporary expanded access. So thank you for addressing it. Um, so I feel like that is an, um, perhaps not a new challenge. It's just being amplified right now. Um, Olivia, I was thinking about you with this question, um, in large part, and I, I think this is also having that, um, longer term relationship with you, but, you know, TCC is known for being kind of that, the first Z degree, you know, this, um, shining star quite early in OER. Um, and so I'm just wondering, you know, have there been new challenges for open education? I've heard you talk a lot about the challenges on campus and in your managerial role, but um, thinking about those newer challenges to open education. Oh, yes, there are always new challenges. Um, we, um, yeah, so TCC, we've been through, we've been doing this for a while and so we've been through ups and downs and growing pains with our z degree and um we already kind of had we've sort of had two challenges simultaneously occurring you know we've had the um covid19 challenges but we also at this exact same time were running into the end of our contract with lumen learning so our z degree had been built in collaboration with them on their platform um, for the most part. And our um, community college system this year stopped paying for that contract. Uh, and TCC does not have the money to continue to pay for that contract um, so that the students will have free access. So in a way, I feel like what's happening now is, is sort of masking the um, chaos that already would have <laughs> been occurring as faculty are having to 
either begin charging students still a low cost, you know, it's still under $40, but we can't, we can no longer say um, you will not pay any money for course materials, you know, to complete the Z degree if you're having to pay $35 for access to Waymaker um, to, to take your course through that. So um, we already had a huge mass of faculty who are needing to shift from Lumen's platform into a more homegrown version of um, just building their OER courses directly in Canvas, our LMS. Uh, and so we've got that, but then we have this influx of new faculty now who are interested, which is great, but how are the libraries and how is TC and our very small staff of instructional designers going to support that? So we have already the faculty that needed to transition their courses who were previously teaching using OER. And then we have new faculty who are now realizing the challenges of the textbooks that they were using, um, the need to be more flexible and adaptable in the future moving forward. Um, and so at the same time, of course, we've got then this upcoming budget crunch where all of our positions are frozen. Um, and so I would say the, the newest challenges for us are just how are we going to sustain this internally, um, you know, with, without money, without grants and that sort of thing. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Olivia. I, I think that um, you've touched on a major challenge that we hear um, from a lot of people. It was, again, a question that came through on that survey around budgets. Um, before we kind of get into some more questions from people um, on the session, Elaine, I was hoping you could speak to this one um, about found opportunities, especially because you talked about you know, you're seeing people that are wanting to push through and get through their program, like get through their projects right now. And, and um, Olivia's mentioning, you know, new faculty that are interested in this. Um, and so I'm just wondering if, if there are any additional found opportunities that you are seeing right now. Well, you're, yes, that's right about the, you know, the, the renewed interest in completing projects. Um, the other opportunities have just been, you know, we're trying to expand um, our partnerships with the academic units. So right before all of this happened, I had just worked out um, a plan with the history department, with the chair of the history department, who is, you know, one of our, our campus OER affordability champions to expand the reach of um, US history surveys so that you know any student who takes a US history survey will not have a textbook cost. So they're gonna do that with OER and affordable resources. So that was kind of um, an opportunity we were working on before and have kind of worked on it more this summer. Um, and then, you know, so that has kind of spurred my interest in working with other kind of course coordinators to do that kind of thing. Um, I've got a couple of targets in mind. Um, our bookstore, which is another um, opportunity that I'm going to be um, exploring more in the next month is our bookstore was campus owned until March 1st when it was outsourced to Barnes and Noble. So we haven't yet talked to their management yet. We had a very good relationship with the previous management. You know, Barnes and Noble's brought in all of their own people. So that is going to be, um, I'm gonna call it an opportunity to explore, um, you know, building some kind of partnership with them. And also I've been working more closely with our course reserve staff, um, just because, you know, we all know the challenges that offsite um, services have have brought on for course reserves, you know. Um, so we're talking more about how they can, when they um, speak with faculty about their course reserves, also throw in a pitch for OER. So those are some of the kind of um, new explorations that you know we've we've looked at. Thanks, Celine. Um, we are coming to a quarter of the hour, so I'm going to move to the last prepared question. Um, and let each of you answer it very briefly, please, um, so that we have time to take questions from um, attendees. So a very general question, 
what would you like people to remember moving forward? Ariana, I'm going to start with you. Mine's pretty simple and short and sweet. I would say remember to take care of yourself during this time and probably forever also. Um, I mean, I think I mentioned early on in the session, I'm in a situation where I feel like compared to other people, like I, you know, ever other people have it worse than me. Like you can always think someone else has it worse and I'm doing okay, but you still need to remember to take care of yourself. Um, and that's really, really important. Um, do what you need to do to keep you yourself healthy um, and okay. Ariana, that was, thank you. Thank you. Lauren, could I ask you next, what would you like people to remember? Oh, can I just say ditto what Ariana said? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that sort of taking a step back in the big picture of this moment is, you know, we're talking about this because we're dealing with a global pandemic. It's affecting everyone really different ways and putting challenges on, on, on everyone that we work with um, as parents, caregivers, um, just human beings kind of having complete uncertainty about the future. And so um, I appreciate in my library, there's a real focus on prioritizing care before sort of um, looking at opportunities to do expanded things. So um, I think, you know, passing that along, this kind of um, um, care and, as you mentioned earlier, compassion and graciousness during this time, um, and uh, not sort of letting the moment of, wow, there's so much opportunity right now to, to do stuff to sort of get in the way of, um, of having that compassion and slowing down and kind of um, giving space to a lot of people. So, yeah, that's what I would Thank say. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Michael, do you want to add something? What would you like people to remember? A uh, couple things. First off, uh, I think Lauren said it very well one of the first times she spoke. She said it was a COVID moment. And uh, I, it, it's that word moment to me that is so key. It, it, it is a moment. It, it is an experience we're going through right now. We will get through this. Um, we have no choice. We will get through this. Uh, some, will, some of us will be a little better off than others of us, depending on our campus, the people we're working with. But related to that, since it is a moment, um, the things we are learning, once we come out of this moment, I would hate for us to step back into where we were prior COVID pre-COVID, this is such an opportunity to learn so much about ourselves, about our situations, our campuses. And the things we start doing now, we should really just continue on. Well, those things that work, we should continue on. It's such a great learning moment for us. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, I don't think this is the last moment we're going to have. We have all sorts of other things going on in the world wars, politics, the, the race things that are going on right now, all of these things continue to swirl around us and will continue to affect how we react and how we deal with these issues. So be prepared to deal with them. This situation has taught us the flexibility and capability that we have to deal with these difficult situations. Thank you, Michael. Elaine, your turn. So I would just say um, flexibility is the key. Just remember to remain flexible. Um, and then the other thing, um, just remember the students. Um, and some are not only facing the uncertainties of their education and challenges to affording it, but you know the trauma of racism on their campuses and then the constant barrage of news and social media and all the negativity out there. So we just need to keep remembering to keep the, the students um, as our central focus. Thank you. Olivia. Oh no, I have to wrap this all up. I wholeheartedly agree with everything that the other panelists have said and said very eloquently. Um, I guess I'll just add for people who are maybe feeling stressed or pressured that like they're not doing enough right now or, you know, open education is not the top priority at the moment. Um, never fear, you know, we're responding to an emergency. And I think that 
um, we can be very hopeful for the future, for the future of open education on our campuses. The groundwork has already been laid for that. And as soon as faculty have a little time to adjust and kind of come out of the, you know, tunnel vision, stress, get my course ready mode, um, I think that there's a good groundwork, like I said, set for um, moving toward more open educational practices and um, use of, of open textbooks and, and other OER. And then um, finally, at least for me personally, maybe for others, it's easy to become hyper-focused on the things that are within our job responsibilities. So something like open education and OER, and those are wonderful things, but you know, our focus, of course, always needs to be on student uh, learning and equity of access to education. And there are a ton of different components and strategies around that even beyond um, open education and just to keep our, our eyes and our minds open to, to all of those um, different approaches. Thank you. Um, we have a few questions that are swirling around. And so I'd like to um, ask one that came through our survey and it connects to one that is coming into the Q&A, specifically around budgets um, and layoffs. Um, and so, the question, um, and I, it's, I'm not going to formulate it well because I'm going to try to combine these two things together. So, you know, budgets are being severely impacted as a number of you have talked about. And um, there's kind of this, this challenge around are, are layoffs affecting your OER programs? Um, and I think that's true both in terms of staffing as well as um, student assistance. Um, I think we've seen some of that on the OTN Google group, people saying, you know, I don't know how I'm going to do my do as much as I was going to do without a student assistant to help. Um, and so I'm wondering if any of you have anything to share about what you're seeing with this or what how you're thinking about it. <laughs> don't you all speak at once. Well, I don't know how helpful this is because I'm not currently being, or our OER program is not currently being impacted by layoffs, um, but our university is certainly going to have to handle budget cuts across the board. So that is something I'm thinking about um, in terms of making the case for um, maintaining the resources that we do have. Um, so it is on my mind, and I think you I mean, this does impact students in such a clear way um, that you can make that justification, I think, um, that, you know, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but I'm just thinking, well, this is the funding we have. This is what it goes towards. Here's how it has a direct impact on students. So that is um, part of what I'm thinking about right now um, in looking to the future. You know, one of the other questions we received is around making the business case for open education. And I'm wondering if any of you are retooling that um, argument that you're making at, at the budget level. Have any of you been asked to talk more about open education as part of a funding conversation? Or are you changing what you're saying about open education at this time in order to to make a more compelling case? I wouldn't say that I'm changing anything. Um, I've always felt the pressure to make it a compelling case from a budget perspective. Mm -hmm. But I think also that, you know, the powers that be on campus have to understand that all that takes time too, because mm -hmm you have to get people on board and actually using the resources for it to make a difference in the lives of the students on your campus. So, you know, I, I just, I think that's a pressure that's always been there. Does anyone want to add anything? Olivia? I'll just add that, you know, enrollment already was and will probably continue even more so to be a uh, concern for those of us in the community colleges, at least in Virginia, and I think you know pretty much nationally, and also at our um, our four-year counterparts. So, 
anything that we can do to kind of, you know, entice students. Um, of course, we may be coming into a recession, which is sometimes a good time for community colleges as people are trying to retool and get back into the job market. So uh, I know that it's going to be a priority that what I mentioned about rebuilding our Z degrees so that we can say to students, you know, come here and at least, you know, not only will this be an affordable education for you um, at a community college, but you will not have to, you know, expend that additional money for your course materials. So I think that argument will continue to be very compelling. Would anyone like to add anything? Okay. Um, I think one last question was around um, helping faculty um, who have made the change to their course. You know, they did it in this emergency situation. Um, and they might have done it in a way that did not include OER, but they did revamp their course. Do you have any tips for helping a faculty member make the transition again, right? They had to make that change. And now it's like, oh, maybe they are interested in open, but they just finished doing it, that exhaustion. Any tips for addressing that in working with those faculty? I would say, uh be patient with them. Um, the, the, the faculty, as you say, have undergone a lot. And the key is to be patient, but also persistent. Because some of them will dial into this open a lot quicker than others. And those that dial in quickly, you can talk to more quickly, get the, the content in their hands more quickly. Those that don't catch on to it near as quick, just be patient. Um, promote other faculty who are doing this and the successes that you found, find ways to connect what you do with what they do. And one of the things that, that I really love doing is getting the subject librarians involved and getting them connected with the faculty. I am not a subject expert, but I can put them in contact with a subject expert, which also requires training the subject librarians to understand what this means and how they can have these same conversations with the faculty that they're working with. Lauren, I saw you almost wanting to say something. Do you want to add anything there? Um, yeah, I think I was uh, having a thought about sort of open pedagogy and how if you're trying to sort of sell faculty on moving to OER, I think in a way there's, you know, this uh, ways of teaching that sort of take the focus away from the faculty and put it into a very like student centered learning environment. And so that could perhaps be a, a, another sort of selling point for faculty is, you know, it's not just sort of about the resources and what you're offering and the affordability of those, but um, sort of taking you away even more from that sort of stage, sage on the stage um, format of teaching, which may, may take some pressure off and sort of offer faculty new opportunities to um, see their students engaging with, with openness. Um, so, yeah. Great, great. Um, we are just coming on to the hour. So I want to thank the panelists so much for your thoughts and your flexibility. Um, in this session and sharing your own perspectives. I want to thank audience members for submitting questions before and after, or pardon me, before and during. Um, and so um, here's contact information for our panelists um, if you want to reach out to them. But thank you all so much for joining us today and for joining us at the OTN Summit.